pleasure of interviewing Jim Kane from SunTrust, uh, and uh, Jim uh, currently works down in the uh, uh, Richmond area and consistently uh, cranks out about four to five million a month. And uh, I just thought that before we'd actually get into what you're doing today, today's environment, uh, everybody likes to know. We we'll start off the interview the same way, but. Uh, everybody likes to know where people came from and where they went to school and and how you got in the business and and when. Okay. Well, I, I went to uh, the school close by. I mean, high school locally in Richmond at St. Christopher's uh, High School mm-hmm. Prep School, and then ended up uh, graduating from Hampton Sydney College, which is uh, yeah, great school. One of the few uh, all male schools remaining, uh, for better or for worse, and uh, finished there in in eighty two. And uh, actually had a degree in economics there, and then, to be honest with you, stumbled into the into the mortgage banking business. Actually, it uh, interviewed in retail banking for Wachovia, uh, and then and it ended up interviewing in the mortgage area after I had gone through several interviews. And now, is this was, right after college, or did you go into yeah. service, or this was actually about a year after I finished school? I mm-hmm. took took a year off and. Uh, Okay. Taught, ten- taught tennis and traveled around Europe. <laughs> okay, you're man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was really my beginning was uh, was with Wachovia in Greenville, South Carolina, as a loan officer in 1983. Uh, well, how'd you end up back in the uh, Richmond area? Well, after two years with Wachovia, uh, they gave me an opportunity to open. A Wachovia mortgage office and be the manager of the office in Richmond. So I felt like that was a that was a pretty neat thing, particularly after just being in the business for two years. So I, I opened up Wachovia's first residential mortgage office in mm-hmm. the uh, Virginia, in the state of Virginia, and in Richmond in particular. And then hired you know loan officers and support staff from that point onward, and spent another uh, three years with Wachovia, and then ultimately made one other move, and then opened Perpetual's office in, in Richmond as well, and then left them in a couple of years, mm-hmm. and then ended up with... Uh, now, you're not talking about trust. Uh, Perpetual that was located up in Northern Virginia. Yeah, exactly. It's Jay Elder and uh, Mark yeah. Stam. And, exactly. Uh, I, I didn't know that. We'll, we know a million people together. <laughs> it's, a, it's a small universe, trust me. That's right. So I, really just the third company is Crestar, and I've mm-hmm. been with them for a little over 10 years. I see. Um, when you started uh, out in business, uh, did you start by uh, going after realtors, or did you uh, have some of the area that you started with? Well, in Greenville, South Carolina, I didn't know anyone, uh, being a native of Richmond, Virginia. So I, I started probably like most uh, rookie loan officers calling on realtors and, and builders. And because I, didn't know, I didn't know anyone locally, didn't have any uh, – friendships that I had forged, you know, as as a young, as a youth, if you will. So I had to pretty much start with uh, with cold calls and, and, um, and, and builder and realtor business and just had an opportunity to build that over a couple of years to the point where I was, you know, producing pretty effectively. Uh, Jim, uh, I was talking to Don a little bit earlier, and uh, one of the things that uh, uh, struck him and, and me too and uh, was the way the business has uh, changed over the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years from when you got in. And uh, I'm a little older. I was in before you, but uh, uh, the, how dramatically the business has changed. And uh, so my first kind of pointed question to you is uh, what advice would you have for uh, some of the new loan officers out there that are, you know, only been in the business two or three months, uh, maybe seven or eight uh, at the max. What advice would you have for them starting out in, in the environment that we're dealing with uh, today? Because the landscape certainly has changed. Well, I, t- I tell you, you can. Uh, we've got a couple of folks that were hired by Crustar SunTrust in in 1998, which, as you know quite well, was a banner year sure. with Great Levi's. Year. And then we've we've hired some folks uh, at the end of middle of the end of last year, so you couldn't have two more different years. So what I'm what I'm telling the the, the people that I've I actually have a, a rookie loan officer that's been with with me for a few months now is that th- this is really the best time to get in the business. In fact, a lot of the a lot of the periodicals that you pick up rank uh, loan consultant, loan officer in the top top forty uh, as far as uh, good paying jobs. And Absolutely. In fact, I think it's ranked 29th. So uh, 
that type of thing, I, I just normally, I just really encourage the the loan officer to to be patient and 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 to work work very hard and very smart. I mean, I know this; these are all cliches. We've heard them all before, but it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I can I can feel comfortable that my production is going to continue to grow year in and year out. Uh, but but that's not something that just happened. It took a lot of nurturing relationships and, and a lot of hours to make that happen. Well, that, that's what I want to focus in on uh, for these new people that are out there. Uh, what do you think they need to do to, to, to make it happen specifically? Specifically? Uh, I, I just want to put it in, uh, I didn't mean interrupt as much as I wanted to frame the issue a little more uh, by throwing out a couple things like uh, um, uh, situations now where a lot of realtors, for example, have their own mortgage subs, where it's harder to get into the back offices today. There's a, a lot more obstacles, as you know. So it's, it's that, that's what I want to frame the issue in. Well, uh, specifically, it probably was about six or seven years ago that that I de-emphasized my my business uh, with realtors and builders. Uh, so I, I really w- I would like to think that I was maybe even slightly ahead of the curve, certainly not behind the curve. When when you hear you know the, the Todd Duncan seminars and all mm-hmm. that, they're talking about the, that the realtor really isn't going to save you from this point onward. That you've got to have your you know affinity groups and and you've got to have your own sources, uh, and then maybe you can refer those sources to the realtor. So it's a little. Little, little bit more of the opposite situation, but I would specifically ask the loan officer to to write down what it is that they want to accomplish in the way of specific goals, and that goal could be related to money, uh, or it could be related to the number of units per year or or dollar volume. But they need to get specific, and then and then celebrate small victories. I think a lot of us, you know, can't see the forest for the trees. I mean, I think we want to we see the fifty and hundred million dollar producers, and we think. Well, okay, that's where I want to be, but but we forget that you've got to get to, to one million a month, and then two million a month, and three million a month before you can get to uh, to five and ten million a month. So, I, I think specifically they they need to set up a realistic goal and then achieve those goals and and just raise the bar each uh, each and every week or month or however often that they're going to reevaluate these things. Well, you know, they say goals have to be not only realistic, they have to be achievable. Or exactly. Or to start off saying you're going to do $3 million a month within uh, four months is, you know, absurdity. It really is. And they've got to find out what it is that they have, this particular loan officer has to offer, that's unique, that gives them a competitive edge, and, and uh, whatever it is that, that they do that they feel like is unique and special and adds value to their customer. And, of course, they've got to identify who their customer is going to be. I mean, it's not individual, just the realtors or the builders. It needs to be, it could, it could be your brother. Uh, it could be your sister, your mother. It could be a friend, a friend of your, your, your brother's or whatever. I mean, anybody out there is a potential customer, and you need to put together that database uh, as quickly as possible and, and start working it. And, and, and there needs to be some, some system in place. And if you can't manage that system alone, then you're going to need to invest some money in, in trying to get an assistant, which I know these are all the buzzwords we hear nowadays is database and assistance. But I think you have to get to that point eventually if you want to get to the next level. Well, the loan officers that are starting out today, um, I, I want to uh, uh, focus on the on something that that actually is a little bit different because most of the people that I uh, talk to and interview, uh, they stress you know starting off with realtors and everything. You seem to be saying something a little bit different that perhaps the way to go is not to focus exclusively on realtors, but to uh, get out early and start hitting your CPAs and exactly. attorneys and uh, uh, wh- whatever you're going to do. Well, I mean, uh, the largest percentage of my business is not realtor business, and that's by design. I mean, I have several realtors that I've worked with for for years, I mean, 12, 13 years, and, and those are wonderful relations, relationships, and I wouldn't give them up. But then there are those realtors that you've had relationships with, and I know you did when you were in the business, where, you know, they were high maintenance, low profit, and, and you you need to decide what what's going to work for you. And I think a lot of times if you choose your customer as opposed to the other way around, then you control your destiny. I think you can uh, you can live a, a much more positive uh, uh, life and, and have a much more positive professional career. So I think it's more directed at... Uh, at, at really everyone else, uh, 
as you mentioned, the accountants, uh, real estate attorneys, appraisers, inspectors. I mean, anybody that's in our industry, and then even some that are not. But I like the idea of the stockbroker, since mm-hmm. both of my brothers are brokers, and my father was one one of the original eight at Wheat First Securities. Mm-hmm. So I mean, we have a, a I have a brokerage background in my family. So I think there's a great amount of synergy in that. Yeah, th- that just came up for the first time in a recent interview, and what I found interesting about it is that uh, while and there's probably a lot of loan officers out there, top ones that that practice that, uh, it's an area that really has never come up, and uh, this person I interviewed, uh, she made the point that if you can deal with the stockbroker and show them how you have specific programs that where that's where that client will keep money in his pocket, right. whether it's 100 percent down, you know, a loan amount or whatever, uh, those stockbrokers are going to love you because that means they these clients have more money to to put in them. Yeah, uh, into it, their program. You couldn't ask for a better reciprocation. Right, exactly. I, I, I think it's just a, I think it's just a wonderful idea. Uh, how would you go about doing that if you were a new loan officer going to stockbrokers? Well, that's always the most difficult thing: is how do you get your your foot in the door? Um, that's why I'm asking it, you. <laughs> if it hasn't been done before, I mean, if, if this particular brokerage firm has has not been approached, then I think you've got to you've got an end. I mean, I think that you can, you, you would start, hopefully you would have some, someone there that you, that you met or that you know, or that some, a friend of yours knows that would be the best connection. Then once you're, you're in the door, whether you're talking to, uh, the, the administrative assistant that that's on the floor or whomever, I think that's where you've got to start. And then, and then try to get face to face with one of the, uh, the brokers themselves and uh, and and prove to them that you've got something of value that they're going to be able to uh, to find some real benefit with and and perhaps generate some more commission income out of. I think that's probably the same in just about any any business you're trying to get your foot in the door. There, it always helps to have someone that you know that has uh, has a connection there. That way, you're not having to just really just call up on the phone on a cold call basis and, and just hope and pray that you that you get in by using, you know, a Dennis Black technique or something. Right. You know, there's nothing better than reference selling where you can call somebody up and throw a name out and they can call back and, yeah, that guy's great. Couldn't recommend him more. Exactly. What about, I'd like to, I'd actually like to jump back and talk about realtors a bit. Uh, once again, it, it's a different environment out there. It's a lot harder, I think, with realtors. And we're going to cover some of the other areas, whether it's direct sales or new homes or whatever. But, uh, for, for realtors now, what, what do you think the approach would be for loan officers? Well, for, for me, the, the, the unique thing that I think that I have brought to the Richmond, uh, real estate market is from an educational standpoint. I'm, I, from what I understand, the only uh, licensed real estate finance instructor uh, I know in the Richmond Association of Realtors and perhaps the only lender that's licensed by the Commonwealth of Virginia to teach the GRI classes for the Virginia Association of Realtors. So, you know, some people might think, well, you know, what good does teaching classes to realtors do, uh, particularly if it's not in Richmond. But if if you think long enough, you'll be able to figure out that you know you've got a captive audience for several hours of several weeks in a row, particularly if they're studying to get their broker's license. That, that was the, uh, the this focus is not on me, but that was the secret to my fortune in the business years ago. About because that. I had been the top agent all along in Foster. Uh, which doesn't mean too much to people outside of the area, but in your area, you know, it was pretty significant. And so when I started to teach, uh, I, I went and taught loan officers, but I taught them, uh, I mean realtors, but I taught them, uh, not, um, uh, not mortgage banking. I taught them how to close real estate. Exactly. How they can, uh, through creative financing, you know, legitimate ethical, uh, financing practices, you can get somebody in and, and enable them to, to sell and close more houses. Well, that, that's really what's happened with me, where you'll have 25 local realtors in a class, and you're teaching them real estate finance. So you, you become the expert, at least you hope, that, that's in right. their mind. And then, uh, and then you very subtly, because you have to be careful since this is, uh, you're supposed to be neutral up there, so you don't really even mention your company. But they, as most people will tell you, you're selling yourself most of the time anyway. 
So, you know, through just a natural course of being in front of these folks for several weeks on end, uh, they become comfortable with you. And then when they think of finance or, or a loan, they associate you with that. So that, that's that been a, a really a very helpful piece of my business and probably the main reason I still have a lot of realtor referred business even today. Wouldn't you agree that... Um uh, and I know you will, but I'm setting you up here. But wouldn't you agree that uh, if you can teach, uh, you can make your fortune in this business because uh, the realtors out there, new realtors, old realtors, uh, if if you can teach them something, and I'm not just talking mortgage bank, if you can teach them how to sell and how to close and whatever, uh, they, they will come to to your table. I had reached a point in uh, my business where managers would call begging me because I never took more than seven people in a class. Uh, they, w- they would call and just beg me to take their people. Right. That's exactly right. I mean, I think that, uh, that if, if they even have a remotely uh, think that you're going to be able to give them some idea or some creative twist or something that uh, that's going to enable them to, to get that one more deal at the end of the year that could put them over $1 million, $2 million, $3 million, or get them to the, the diamond or platinum or whatever the award is, uh, there's no question that they're going to want to be a part of that. So I, I think that's what you, what you really try to, try to emphasize at the right time when you're in these classes. And you let them make sure you get them out on time. <laughs> That's the other thing. Mm-hmm. Don't want to be. Don't, you don't want to. Sh- you want to show up on time. And let them leave on time, or maybe even a little early. So, but that's that's been a fun experience for me. I enjoy teaching as it is, so that that's worked out well for me. It gives me a chance to mm-hmm. uh, get out of the office as well, which is all, often difficult to do. Yeah, I, I I like the idea. I want to pursue it a little bit on a little bit lower level. Uh, as I said before we started, I've never done an interview where someone didn't have uh, either a new idea, a new twist, or uh, a new focus on how they did their business. But I think we have to recognize with the listeners out there, they're not all going to be at your level uh, where they're capable of teaching a, a GRI level course. But right. um, I, I wonder if you would address the, just the concept and value of them developing some sort of a, a teaching vehicle. Well, the truth is I was asked by what was then Bowers, Nelms, and Fonville uh, back in 1987, which was my second year in Richmond and my fourth year in the business, I was asked by them to uh, to help with their teaching of FHA and VA business because that was that was an area that they felt like they needed some some help in. Well, to make a long story short, I I handled their training finance training for several years until they uh, got their own in-house uh, lender company, if you will. I'm not sure what they called it initially, but where you the lender was required to give up a half a percent of the origination fee uh, to be a part of their five or six lender program and we i just wasn't willing to do that it's just like you know mm-hmm. giving up a part of your six percent real estate commission yeah that's right didn't feel like that that was that was warranted and, and as it turned out i continued to get a lot of business from bowers and elms which is now you know bowers and elms and Fonville long and foster but mm-hmm. uh th- that's i got a fairly early start in in the teaching of classes i mean granted four years is is still probably to those that are just in the business still a fairly long time but that's my, that's been my point from the beginning of this conversation John and that is that you it just takes time i mean if if you want to to thrive in this business then you've just got to be very patient and but you've got to have a plan you've got to know okay well teaching is what i like to do i think i'm good at it here's my start i'm starting at bowers and elms and and maybe i'm going to end up and teach for the state you know that that would be that was my sort of goal but you've got to d- identify and strictly define these goals early on and write them down and put them somewhere it's vi- where it's visible and if you don't do that then I, you know, I think that you're you're probably not committed to this business and you might want to select another career i think that sounds harsh <laughs> be a taxi driver well, there's an old saying, you know, if you can't close, you may as well get on a, a bus and be a tour guide. Exactly. You know, the version of that. <laughs> um, let me ask you, um, uh, as, far as, long, as long as we're splitting uh, uh, the business up here, uh, what would your advice be in terms of uh, going after other types of business like CPAs and chief financial officers and, and closing attorneys, for example? Well, I do think that that's an area that a lot of us have heard uh, is is lucrative and, and, and a good area to go into, particularly if you participate in a lot of these seminars, as I mentioned, you know, Todd Duncan and, and whatnot. Uh, 
because you're going to probably have other folks that are pounding on the doors too. I think you once again need to establish some sort of uh, some sort of plan that that differentiates you from the rest of the group, from the rest of the loan officers. And I've contemplated at this point after uh, listening to one of the top producers at one of these master events that. Uh, that you really almost you might want to put a uh, a nice personal brochure together. I'm not really talking about the the small jacket uh, ones that that's much like an eight and a half by eleven that's folded you know three piece basically. Mm-hmm. But I'm talking about a nice you know full eight and a half by eleven flat brochure that would sort of identify you and what you have to offer, but not as not so much as a as a as a as a mortgage banking company person, but more as an individual, so that so that they're working with you as a person as opposed to uh, you as an entity. Sure. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing that I've given some serious thought to. But uh, to to put a nice one together, you're probably talking about ten thousand dollars. So right. I think it's uh, you know, you got to spend money to make money. So I think that that you come back to that. But I think that would be a big end to get into, particularly accountants' offices. Or anyone that's in the financial advisory uh, role, they're, they're going to they're going to be impressed, I think, with that kind of presentation. Yeah, they uh, everybody likes a nice visual. Exactly. Uh, and you know, they talk about newspapers. Uh, you're going to have them on uh, Palm Pilots and all this other stuff. And I, I think to some degree there there is going to be some of that. Um, but you know, people do like feeling that newspaper in the morning and turning that page and. Uh, and so I, I think that kind of visual media will will never go out. And I also think your point of uh, which, and you're certainly not the first in the interviews to to bring this up. Rod Flowers and uh, uh, Don Airman, a lot of bringing it up. You, you have to spend money to make money in this right. business, and a lot of people uh, they fool themselves by not doing it. Right. And the longer you wait, the more people are getting in front of you. I mean, in other words, if you're not willing to go ahead and spend the money now. There's someone else out there that's finally decided to to take the plunge and is and has gone ahead and investing in themselves and they're getting that much further ahead of you because it it's a, it, it really is a snowball effect. Once you start spending the money uh, on yourself, as long as again it's it's worthwhile marketing, you know you're going to see the returns very very quickly. Uh, but once again, if you, you've got to get started sometime, and so you know, no time like the present. Mm-hmm. Uh, how else do you get your business? Well, I mean, I'm in at uh, between 6:45 and 7 every morning, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's not that I work until 6 or 8 at night. Uh, it, you know, I try to leave at a reasonable time, but I, you know, I get in early and I and I get my my da- daily uh, strategy put together so that uh, so that there's no wasted time. I'm not a big believer in spending all your time out of the office necessarily. I mean, I, I take all my loan applications either by phone or in person or through email. Uh, I guess, and, and I really don't have the luxury of an assistant. So I'm one of the probably one of the dinosaurs out there, which could give hope to those loan officers that are just getting in the business that you can still do a decent amount of business if you if you work smart, and that means getting in early and uh, and getting your your strategy together and and just have 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 a marketing plan. I mean, you've got to have some ideas that you're utilizing that are going that's going to enable you to uh, to get more business. And it could be the simple stuff like sending a a weekly update on uh, where we think rates are going, or it could be a, a quarterly newsletter, or it could be, uh, you know, a biweekly rate sheet, or whatever it is that that you do, just just to get your your name and face out in front of the, uh, out of not only your your previous customers that are in your database, but also the real estate customers and affinity groups that you that you have an ongoing relationship with. So I think it's just constantly being in front of these these individuals and groups. Is going to give you a better opportunity to do more business, particularly if rates drop. And that's the hope that rates will eventually drop. But in the meantime, we've got to we've got to get as much business. You know, got a larger piece of that of that dwindling pie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the pie has to dwindle. But you know, this is a very you've been around long enough to know uh, this is a very cyclical. Uh, business, absolutely, uh, almost contrarian sometimes in the sense that sometimes the economy will be doing good, and uh, uh, but if interest rates go up and Greenspan keeps, you know, j- jumping the thing up, uh, it can affect uh, it can affect uh, affect our end of the market. Definitely. Um, when when you first got into the business, did did you have a plan of action? Probably not as as detailed as I as I should have. Uh, 
I, I'm, I'm by nature a pretty competitive person, so I think that's what got me through. So in my opinion, you need to either have a very definitive strategy or plan written down and, and with dates, specific dates, so that you, you it's sort of like your report card. You can see how you're doing. And I would do this with your either your, your manager or someone that you respect within the company that's a good producer. Uh, or the best combination is to do that and be competitive by nature. I think it helps to, to be competitive in the sense that you, you're going to compare yourself to your peers within the company and outside the company, and, and you're always checking those production numbers to see how you stack up. If you've got that kind of that feeling and, and that urge to, to beat out your uh, your opponents, I think that's going to be the catalyst necessary to to you know, beef up your production numbers. Mm-hmm. On, the, on the flip side of the coin, uh, this is an area I don't cover too much, but every once in a while uh, with the right person, I do like to cover it, and, and that is that the, the whole concept of uh, uh, rejection and, and how you handle rejection, understanding that ours is a rejection business. The, the comma in it is that it may be a rejection business, but it's really personal. Right. You know, it's not that I don't like you, it's somebody else has something better or had a longer relationship, but how, how do you handle rejection? Well, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it, I mean, the first thing is that you, you realize that it's not personal, so so then you can deal with it in a, in a much, much better way. I mean, I you know, you always turn a problem or something negative into an opportunity is the way I look at it. So uh, the, the realtor that we're talking about, for instance, may really enjoy working with Bob right now, but there's going to be a time when Bob either messes up or Bob gets out of the business or Bob's processor messes up or the closer does something she, she or he shouldn't have done or whatever. So I, you know, I usually would, would turn that around and just say, well, you know, to the realtor that if, uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that you're working with Bob and you've been so for a long time because that's the type of relationship I've forged with my realtor customers. Uh, in the event that, uh, that, that, that you're ever, dissatisfied with with Bob um, here's my card you know give me a call and, and in the meantime I'll, I'll keep in touch with you with uh, with with new products that I think your you know your clients might need but in other words you sort of just have some reason to follow up with them and you've I think you've planted the seed that that even though they're happy with their you know particular lender you're not uh, ruling out the possibility that uh, that you guys may eventually do business together for one reason or the other yeah well I think um, um it was brought up in a previous interview uh, uh, that you know when when people are starting out today, they're going against people like you. They could crank out fifty million a year, but they don't realize that uh, when you started out, you were going up against people that were uh, doing the same thing. I mean, That's right. everybody's got to start somewhere on on the scale. Well, it's it's funny. I was just reading in Mortgage Originator magazine mm-hmm. uh, yesterday that they were interviewing this skateboarder national champion and they asked him you know well how how is it that you're that you're as as great as you are i mean how did you you know what did you do how did you get to this level and and his answer was well first thing i learned is how to fall and uh i thought that was spectacular for any any business you're in i mean you know you've got to be able to handle rejection you've got to be able to to look at the skepticism in the eye and know that it's it's not personal. It's you know there's legitimate reasons why someone's not going to want to work with you, but it's you, you've got to figure out a way to to present something to them that's going to make them want to work with you. It's just not going to be immediate. This instant gratification thing is is not going to happen in our business. No, it is definitely not an instant gratification unless you're in a refi uh, right. business. And I've already told the story once, so I, I just got to do a, a shortened version of it, but. Uh, um, I, I knew somebody who got in the business. Uh, and this has got to be 15. I don't know. It could be 20 years ago. <laughs> Whatever it is, it was one of the great refi opportunities of all time. And this kid was new, and he literally, um, he literally could go down the street and knock on doors and get applications. He said about every third house he was on it, and he just had, uh, he, I don't know, over, certainly over 100 apps in there just sitting there. And uh, it, uh, uh, the problem was is that the, uh, uh, it, it couldn't get processed. The, you couldn't get a processor to save your life. He was literally coming in, throwing this stuff on the thing, wasn't even acknowledging the processor, and off to the next one. 
And so the processor is working with people who, uh, you know, were given a little, a little extra money, taking her out to lunch and uh, doing all that. And all of a sudden the market turned and, the, you know, uh, all the locks went out and nothing had been processed. And his head got banged out so bad that he, he, he couldn't stand it. He, he literally, he called me up crying one day. And just, exactly. I couldn't save him and he ended up getting out of the business. He's probably selling cars somewhere. <laughs> well, that's the danger. I mean, I tell you, if I were given a choice of, uh, if I had two loan officers that were one hired in 98 and one hired in, say, August or September of 99, despite the fact that the 98 loan officer was more seasoned, I would choose the 99 loan officer over the 98 loan officer for that very reason. Because if, 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 they can, if they can learn how to do business in this very difficult market that we're in now, then, you know, my feeling is that they're, you know, <laughs> the light at the end of the tunnel is definitely going to be there. But if you come in the market and you're an order taker, I tell you, that's a tough, tough situation to have changed on you at the drop of a dime or a hat, which is what's happened here, you know, last year. In fact, I'm trying to remember when it really started heading heading south or north, depending on how you look at it. I guess it was the middle part of the year when rates started moving mm-hmm. up. I think in June is when the Fed made its first move up. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, from that point onward, the, the business has slowed dramatically. So I would I would think that, uh, that the loan officer that's that's learning under the most difficult of conditions that can persevere, then, then they're going to probably be a bigger producer in the end. Yeah, I think so. I got, I got in at a, at a tough time and... Uh, uh, you know, we're all not as lucky. I mean, some, some people I've talked to got in, you know, at the height of these uh, refis, and it was just, we became order takers the day they got in the business. Exactly. Which is kind of neat from a, you know, a money standpoint, <laughs> but, uh, you know, helps with that, with that curve. I, I tell you, it's not to say that the 98, the loan officer hired in 98 won't be successful. I don't, I don't want to give that impression. In fact, if that loan officer was, uh, was 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 thrifty and and invested that money uh, in themselves, then they they would have a you know a leg up on, on on that loan officer that didn't have the foresight to do that. So you could certainly turn that into a positive and and, and do even more production based on uh, on all that money you made in '98. Yeah. Let me ask you: Do you do uh, uh, do you do things like work with uh, new home builders, or do you do uh, uh, home seminars? Uh, any other things that you do that bring in business that are Maybe a bit unusual, or well, you know, nothing, really, nothing out of the ordinary, John. I mean, the only thing that I used to do a lot of home buying seminars, and I do a few every now and then. Right, right now, we work with uh, I'm uh, the president elect for the Virginia Mortgage Bankers Association, and work a lot with uh, the Virginia Housing and Development Authority, which is the the bond, yeah, the VHDA, uh, right, mm-hmm. exactly, here in Richmond, and uh, we do home buying seminars for first time home buyers at their corporate headquarters in downtown Richmond. And we'll have 100 folks in those classes, uh, and, and they're held every month. And so, yes, I get, I, I do a good bit of that. Uh, and I used to do home buying seminars for, for you know, uh, renters. You know, we would put an advertisement uh, in the paper as well as send one to the apartment complex. And uh, I used to do that in, in uh, conjunction with a realtor uh, that I was doing business, a good bit of business with. But, you know, that, that was high a lot of high maintenance stuff there in the sense that you you spend a lot of time doing that and you you'd have maybe 8 to 10 people show up and you know you might get two or three deals which is still still good and and probably worth the time but as i found you know getting more seasoned in, in as far as being a loan officer i i found that there are other avenues that would probably bring about better results with less time and so you have to just pick those activities that you think are going to Return you the the largest number of deals with, without the uh, without the hassle and, and the uh, and, and the nuisance that that sometimes doing sending out mailers to hundreds of people might might cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I quoted this a couple of times, and the person that did it, uh, even though it's not his quote, and that is, you know, operating towards those centers of influence. I think Todd Duncan uh, hits that stuff too, where you you focus in on the people who can make a difference and, and really bring the business in and. And not waste your time, as you say, sending uh, mailers out all over the place, hoping that something hits the barn. Right. Well, I'm a strong believer, John, in in that uh, participating, and this is probably an angle that that most folks don't really think about, and, and that is getting involved with your mortgage banking uh, association. And um, I was president of the uh, of the Richmond Mortgage Bankers Association. Uh, gosh, back in 1997, I guess it was. It was only a few years ago. 
And then, you know, we'll have an opportunity to be president of the Virginia Mortgage Bankers Association next year. And, and I've enjoyed doing that, and it, and it is time-consuming, but you, you really are associating, you, you know, with, with a lot of very good professional and long-termers in the business. So my advice to a, a new loan officer who's getting in the business, whether they're a broker or a banker, is, is get involved in either the Mortgage Brokers Association or the Mortgage Bankers or both. And start associating, like you just mentioned, with with others that are committed to this industry and and are willing to take educational classes and whatnot and invest in themselves, like we've been saying all along. I, I'm a strong believer in that. So that's probably my my other activity, other than teaching the real estate classes, that I feel like have really been helpful. And it doesn't hurt as far as hiring new loan officers either. No, not at all. And it's kind of an extension of that. Uh, uh, I don't want to beat the subject to death. I have in a couple of the interviews, and that's the interaction uh between loan officers that uh, uh that you can trade information uh between loan officers uh, uh even uh competitive companies that are that are in different market areas that's right e- exactly and you know suntrust slash questar i mean we've we're starting to get a lot more involved with each other the in other words the managers and other offices like you know don Ehrman, for instance and and, and uh, both Don and I made a trip to uh, to Rod Flowers' office in Salisbury, and, and got, in fact, Mark Lynch was there as well, and got a tremendous amount of benefit from from Rod and, and his I heard staff. About that. And he was Rod was nice enough to to spend a, an entire day with us. I mean, so it's very unselfish, uh, you know, on his part to do that, given given his level of activity that he's got. But this is the kind of thing that you can enjoy not only within your own company, but you know, by by just asking and talking to those that are, uh, you know, in the industry and working for other companies. Do you, uh, uh, when you went down and talked to Rod Flowers, I, I know that he's a very intense uh, person, a wonderful interview. Uh, do you think you got a lot out of the exchange? Absolutely. In fact, I've already implemented uh, three of the uh, of the activities that he's currently using and have found them to be very, very useful and, and productive. What, what were they? Well, he uh, he sends when when someone gets a, like a realtor takes a, a GRI class, or and this is right up my alley. As a matter of fact, since I'm teaching those classes, if they pass their GRI, he'll send them the uh, the you know the Dilbert mints. You've got uh, four different kinds mm-hmm. of Dilbert mints. These these you know very strong peppermint intense peppermint mint. Oh yeah, he covered. It. Go ahead, I love it. I love the story. He'll he'll send. Uh, you know, a little box that contains, you know, I don't know, maybe 20, 20 of these, uh, these mints. And, and on the uh, package, it has four different types, either manage mints, improve mints, accomplish mints, or perform mints. And so you send the appropriate box uh, to the realtor, depending on what he or she has done. Like if they're opening up their own company, then you, you send them perhaps manage mints, uh, if, you know, if they just got their broker's license mm-hmm. or... You know, or improvements, or you know, whatever, or if like I said, they pass the GRI, you send them accomplishments. So, all sorts of different things you can do there. And then the other thing was these uh, compendium cards. If you're familiar with those, where it just sends you, it has a little nice message that you open the flap, just a small, like one inch by one inch, and you open the flap, and it has a a very positive message uh, that uh, you know that you that you know you would send with your card that you that has the Dilbert mitts in it. So it's you know that's that's one of the ideas that Rod has uh, has used in his market, and he's found it to be very very helpful. And the third one, and the third one is really just uh, more advertising uh, in the sense that we're trying. I'm tr- I'm trying to tr- generate some builder activity, which has been missing in my. My uh, my business, so he's he's put together some really neat advertising uh, ideas that that I've been putting together in the newspaper, and that's certainly a little bit more bland and not as uh, not as neat. Actually, some renovation loan kind of thing, so you can go into consumer direct. Just some ideas like that. That uh, as you've noticed, the uh, the renovation business has it's just exploded over the last mm-hmm. couple of years. So I, I've done a, I do a lot of construction loans. So this I felt like was right up my alley. Uh, emphasizing consumer direct and looking for renovation business. Has it been successful? Yeah, it has. I mean, it, and, and we've, I've sent the same information to the realtors as well, knowing that sometimes you'll have a customer that buys a home that uh, that wants to put 50000 in it, and they can't go with a 203K through FHA, so mm-hmm. we do a conventional construction perm loan for them. And uh, that enables us to do a deal that some of our competitors haven't really gotten on board on yet. 
but at two or three k one time was easy it go up to twenty five thousand right and but if you're talking about someone buying say a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house and they want to put fifty in it <clears throat> you know you, you've got to go with a conventional program right well plus uh, if i think or if i remember in the two or three k there are certain things like swimming pools uh, right. uh, there's a lot of things that you can't use those two or three k's for exactly it's pretty pretty limiting and uh from a qualification standpoint, you're, you're, you're usually going to be fine, but uh, yeah. you are a limited price range. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Uh, that, that's interesting that because uh, uh, the reason I've kind of let you go on that is that Rod, of course, went over every one of the things you're talking about, and here you've taken those and, and now we're getting business from them. So. Exactly, and that was a visit, you know, that that we just uh, we just decided that, you know, it would be a great thing to do, and we didn't want to send six different people at six different times because that would just be too demanding. But I, I bet you, if you were to ask Don specifically, Don Ehrman or, mm-hmm. or or Mark or uh, or anyone else, I, I would I would be surprised if they told you they haven't implemented something. Yeah, right. Well, actually, I have talked to them, and they have, and uh, they thought it was a great highlight. I just like the concept because a lot of people in our listening audience here they have no idea who Rod is or you, and uh, but the, it's the concept of uh, of sharing with other loan officers of, of almost a form of mentoring. Yeah. Uh, that that makes sense. Uh, you know, it just takes one good idea. Um, I keep coming back to the, it's one of the more fascinating things of these little refrigerator plaques where you stick a business card and you can on a magnet and slap it on your uh, uh, refrigerator. I, I can't tell you how many people I do interviews with that tell me how much on their own, unsolicited, uh, that this is one of their little secrets and they and they get an incredible amount of business off these things. Yeah, it's it, it, it's you know, I mean, it's like whoever invented the post-it note or the paper clip. I mean. <laughs> It's a, a seemingly simple idea, but but there are a lot of folks out there that just for whatever reason haven't haven't uh, you know climbed on board yet. But you know, there's a very basic when when I remember many many years ago when I took real estate classes. You know, it's the the cheapest form of advertising or signs, and that's nothing more than a version of that. Right. You know, right. you stick it up there, it costs you nothing, and it's in front of their eyes every day. Yeah, a friend. Uh, in Bel Air, uh, Ed Navarall is a is a big big promoter of signs, and he he probably he's great. the sign guru of that area. Yeah, he's unbelievable. There aren't too many folks that haven't heard of Ed in that particular market, <laughs> and that's the thing. I mean, you've got to you've got to decide what is going to be your medium of exchange. You know, as far as uh, you know, advertising, whether it's you know whether you're going to promote your face or you're going to promote your company or you're going to promote something specific about uh, your products or whatever it is that you're going to try to promote and differentiate yourself. Um, you know, for Ed, it's worked great. And then, you, you know, you've got Don Ehrman in Harrisonburg that that just, you know, has got an incredible amount of uh, repeat business. So, you know, everybody seems to have their, their niche that, that works well for them. Yeah. You raised the word differentiation. And, uh I wondered if you maybe address that because I I do think today when you with all the loan officers running in uh, to realtors and some of the you you need to differentiate yourself. Right, you do. Uh, and my attitude is 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 a little different from uh, from other folks in the standpoint that I I'm a soft seller. I'm not a hard seller. I'm I'm not a big hard closer. Uh, you know when you take the different sales training techniques, you know, whether it be spin or, or whatever, the, the sales technique that you're learning, that I, for me, when I, my differentiation is that I'm, I'm just a very patient person, and, I, you know, my thought is that people are going to want to eventually work with me because I haven't pushed them. And, like, for instance, if I'm at a social gathering, I've never, ever asked a friend, to come to me for a mortgage. I've never asked a, a family member to come to me for a mortgage. And a lot of people say, well, gosh, you know, you've got to ask for the business. It's the old adage, you've got to ask for the business. I, I'm Not necessarily. I found that, that you can, if you strategize properly and develop relationships over time, sometimes it's an implied invitation to do business. And that, for me, is the differentiator, is that I'm I'm patient enough, and, and you got to be stubborn. Born in April, uh, Taurus the bull to, to be I'm a Taurus. <laughs> so yeah, you, you've got to exactly. So I think we've got some similarities. You've got to be patient uh, to do it this way. But I found that it works very effectively. Uh, have I lost some business because I haven't asked for it? Perhaps, but I think I've I've gotten more business because I've I've uh, I've got an implied. Uh, you know, a way of asking for business. Mm-hmm. What's more important, um, 
having um, right, excellent pricing. I'm not saying lowest, but excellent pricing or having uh, programs that are uh, either unique or, or stand out. I have to say the latter. I mean, let's face it. You know, if anyone has excellent pricing, it's not for very long. Uh, it, you know, the, the pricing is is purely driven by by the need to to you know book loans, and and that it's just like you know looking back to my days at Perpetual, I I could see that they were the savings and loan was going to go out of business because they were offering CD rates at thirteen percent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they were trying to pump up the. Uh, the, the deposits so they could lend the money, but you know it's the old savings and loan crisis. You had more money going, going out than coming in. Yeah, where are you going to make fifteen to may even make your spread? Exactly right. So that you know, I think that's that's really what it's all about. That's kind of a simplistic example, but that for me, it's if it were pricing, then we'd be order takers, like you mentioned before. Uh, it's got to be something else that that differentiates you, and whether it's a product, some different spin on a product that you offer, or whatever. If you can, if you've got something that you can, you can uh, extract the need from the customer, and they can admit that they have a need for that particular product. If there's somehow you can get them to admit that, then then you're going to be doing business with them regardless of whether your price is the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about uh, what about your processing today? I've been talking a little bit about the importance of. Uh, of uh, processing, uh, do you have one processor that you have a long-term relationship with? And well, I, I, I used to, and then now she's gone back to school. So, <laughs> uh, she, really, uh, I am on a rotation. So once again, I'm kind of going back to the dinosaur ages as far as uh, processing and closing. I I do have one processor who also closes, uh, and she does probably about thirty percent of my business. And then I have. A, Two other processors that rotate, and then I have one other closer. So it's it's not that's probably not ideal. I mean, if your best situation is if you've got one person that you work well with that can do it all, but that's hard, kind of hard to ask, or or maybe no more than two people would mm-hmm. be ideal. Now we are in an office where we do everything here as opposed to having central processing and central closing. And I know there are arguments on both sides of that, but we 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 sort of like the uh, the local the local. Um, you know, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, years ago, I was regional manager for a company, and they got very big into central processing, and it, uh, it it kind of fell apart. They first off, they found out that the efficiencies they thought they were going to squeeze out weren't really there. Right. They're certainly not there in the amounts that they needed to make it go, and so they ended up uh, decentralizing again. Right, and I can see that happening. But, you know, it's not – I mean, I know some loan officers out there that work for companies that do have centralized processing and closing, and they, they've they adapted well to it. It's just a, you just have to get to know all the folks that are in those areas so that you develop that rapport. And that's the other bit of advice that I would that I would give that I, that I think has, has been a differentiator for me is that I've taken the time when I came on board with Crustar to meet all the key players that were going to affect my – well-being, and I know this is probably, hopefully, something that's been brought up in past interviews. But I think that you have got to develop the rapport with all the folks that are going to have an integral part of your success, uh, inside and outside the company. Inside could probably be, you could make an argument that that's most important because that's that's where your your checks are signed, uh, and that means meeting the, uh, you know, the the underwriters, meeting the uh, the shippers, meeting the uh, secondary marketing folks. I mean, maybe not necessarily in that order, but I mean, I, I would take the time from very early on to meet those those players. As a matter of fact, what if I told you you were the first person to bring that up? <laughs> uh, it's not that they don't. It's just a question of uh, uh, of the of the emphasis. So like, there, there's always something new that comes out in talking to people. Yeah, and 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 that's very valid too. <clears throat> I mean, we all have war stories. Uh, this isn't a war story, but uh, I always try to uh, be friends and uh, have relationships with the closers. Uh, and because every once in a while you needed somebody to come in on a Saturday. There you go. And if they didn't like it, it just wasn't going to happen. Yeah, I mean, you're, 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 I mean, that's the old thing. If, if someone willing to help you, if they know that you've uh, that you've supported them in the past, right? That exactly. You've shown an interest in in their career and their well-being. Uh, let me ask you something. Do you use any particular, because obviously with the volumes you're doing, uh, do you use any particular contact management program? Well, we are, I unfortunately am not utilizing it to its full potential, but but I use Mortgage Quest. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I've already discussed this in some other interviews, so I'm, um, I'm well aware of it. 
But uh, do you find that, uh, how do you keep track of everything? Do you, do you put everything in there? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I'm still, the uh, you know, hunting and pecking on the, uh, on the keyboard here. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think the ideal situation situation would be to pay either an intern or have someone come in, you know, through a temp agency at, uh, at six or $7 an hour and get them to, to feed all the information in. Uh, that would probably be the, the best use of, of the loan officer's time. But yeah, at this present juncture, I am still entering the information, uh, through our front end system, which is Calix. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, fortunately, <laughs> through Carter Technologies, that can be interfaced with uh, Mortgage Quest. You're right, exactly. Exactly. Uh, any other tips for people out there? How about for some of the more seasoned loan officers? For the more seasoned? Or yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. people at your level. <clears throat> Uh, you know, it's. It, it, I think that it just is a question of uh, reevaluating whether whether you enjoy what you're doing. I mean, if this is a career that you want to be in, because I think that there's some of us are going to get to the next level and be the mega producers and 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 just and, and really thrive. But my feeling is there's going to be a, a larger a window or disparity between the do- doers and the. <laughs> And the mm-hmm. doees, if you will. I mean, those that are producing and those that are not. I think that that, and, and it's going to also be true with the realtors. I think you're going to have mega realtors, and then you're going to have those that just, you know, sell a couple of houses a year. I, I think the middle is it, going to be less of the middle with the technology and everything else that's that's going on. I mean, I think that the bundling of services with the large outfits like right. the Country Wise and the Norwest and even the, the SunTrust, this is coming around the corner, and if you're not... If you're not prepared to deal with that, whether you're not with that company or if you're with a company that's sort of a mid-sized company that doesn't have the, uh, you know, the discounting potential and efficiencies that a large company has, then you need to be fleet of foot and need to be a small broker or whatever it is. But I think you need to be one or the other. I think the middle are going to get left out. Well, they've been saying that for years, and, and I happen to agree that uh, uh, the efficiencies in some of the, the middle ones, if they have a lot of bricks and mortar, and right. uh, they, they just cannot react as quickly or take a hit. Right. For, for any sustained period of time. Well, my advice, John, to answer your question is for those folks that are, that have been in the business for a long time, let's say more than 10 years, I mean, they didn't, they need to pick up these magazines, these, you know, mortgage originator magazines. They need to subscribe to your, to, to your company, you know, mortgage mm-hmm. scholars. They need to get as much information as they can. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, it, it's the, uh, once one fellow, I really like what he said. He said, that, you know, knowledge is not power. Action is power. So it's a combination of getting getting the knowledge and then utilizing it. That's going to be the key because if you can't if you can't keep ahead of the other folks like I mentioned before, then you're going to if you're not ahead of them, you're behind them. Yeah, I think this is a great point to end it. I always like to end on a high point. That's a pretty good high point. Uh, I really want to thank you uh, for taking the time to uh, talk to all the people out there, Jim. My uh, pleasure. Very productive, and uh, I can't thank you enough. Great. Enjoy enjoy the conversation. Okay.